Paris Master of Wine. We are uh, excited to do this next segment because we both love sparkling wines. And I think that a lot of people associate Sonoma, Napa, Mendocino, maybe with maybe a lot with reds and some with whites, but they make some of the, the greatest traditional method sparkling wines that, that I've had. And, and truly, some people have mistaken a lot of these for champagne and blind tasting. Some of them are of that high level of quality. Not you. But Not, never. I would never mistake. Yeah. That would never make that mistake. <laughs> Um, but, but it seemed like this would be a good uh, sort of just diversity of, of Northern California wines and um, I really could drink bubbles all day every day so I'm Me in. Too. I'm excited. If it wasn't for the after effect I could drink them all day. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. So we chose some, uh, some iconic producers, right, or some well-known producers uh, from, from California. So we have Mum Napa, they're Blanc de Blancs, uh, Domaine Carneros in, in Carneros and we should also say that Mum is sourcing their fruit, their vineyards are in Carneros as well. Um, all of these really, except for, well, Roderer and, and Schrumsberg have sort of a, a smattering of, of vineyards, Roderer's and Anderson, and uh, Schrumsberg is in multiple places, yeah, correct? Yeah, cooler parts of Northern California, actually Mendocino, Anderson mm -hmm. Valley, Mar Yep, and um, I think it's a good uh, sort of overview of, of, of how good a sparkling wine California can make, but also I think what would be interesting for us to cover is a lot of people find sparkling wines really hard to blind taste because the bubbles sort of make it a little bit challenging to decipher those sort of nuances. But to me, it's one of the most fun categories to blind taste right. because I think you can pull out so many different winemaking techniques and base wine strategies and blending and, and then figuring out whether it was tank method or traditional. I, yeah. I've always really loved sparkling wines. Yeah. Good. And, you know, one of the things we're also doing, uh, again, supporting uh, the recent fires here yes. in Northern California, which affected Mendocino, uh, not Anderson Valley, but Redwood Valley, as well as mm -hmm. uh, Napa and Sonoma. And uh, we'll, you know, hopefully as you watch these videos, if you are so inclined, uh, there's a couple of uh, offers down at the bottom of the link to this yes. video that you can choose to donate to. And we encourage you if you're able to do so. Yes. I got so excited about the bubbles, I forgot to say the, the reason That's why we're good. doing all this. We're having a good time. Yeah. So uh, start Mom, off with start? the Mum Napa. So this is a Blanc de Blanc. Yep. Uh, Non-vintage. And according to the website, it's 90% mm -hmm. Chardonnay and 10% Pinot Gris, uh, and then 18 months on the lees. Yep, and I think um, pointing out, we wanted to have a diverse range of styles. So Blanc mm -hmm. de Blancs, you know, you see that on a lot of labels and you know, white from white grapes. Right. And um, in some cases, it's 100% Chardonnay, depending on the legalities of the region. But in, in California, you can call it Blanc de Blanc, even if it's not Chardonnay. It just has to be white from white. Correct. So mom um, makes a really nice one. Yeah. And, and we, you mentioned earlier that when you do blind tasting, you talk about traditional method and Charmat mm -hmm. or tank method. And yep. We should say these are all traditional methods. Yes. Uh, that is the method that is used in Champagne, mm -hmm. where the wines are fermented uh, initially uh, to a, about 10.5% alcohol. And then they're put into the bottle, added with a little bit more yeast and sugar, and mm -hmm. the yeast ferment that sugar and create the bubbles that are then can, contained in the bottle. So it's a very laborious way to make yep. a sparkling wine versus a tank method where you do everything in a tank. But with that yeast in the bottle, you get this autolysis, which many people um, love that mm -hmm. sort of brioche, toasty, biscuity character. Yep. And this one is, is, as we said, 18 months. You get a little bit of that development. It's really beautifully... Uh, just coming out in a, in a nice, elegant way, but it's you still get the fruit. I mean, I get a lot of that Chardonnay, apples, yep. sort of citrus, fresh pear. And it, I think what's an important, it's good for you to lay out exactly how sparkling wine in the traditional method is made and bottled because it's that contact with the yeast cells when they're done with their job that causes autolysis to happen and causes these sort of bready, toasty qualities to come out. And um, that's what makes it somewhat helpful if you're blind tasting. If you pick up on those, yes. you can attribute that to, okay, this was traditional method. But as you taught me when I was coming up as a student, it's not always autolytic qualities. It's sometimes the texture that mm -hmm. gives away that it's traditional method because um, a sort of byproduct or uh, good effect of autolysis is that it improves mouthfeel right. over a certain period of time. Yeah. So, you know, this is just a, a shorter period, 18 months, but that's... It's not 36 months or 
you know, five years, some champ, some of the best champagnes age their wines on the lees for, you know, five, six, seven years even. Right. But um, but you still get a little bit of it, and yeah. it's very intriguing. Yeah, that creaminess. And the uh, time in the bottle on the yeast also makes the bubbles more mm -hmm. finely delineated and tinier and mm -hmm. creating that creamy, rich mouthfeel. Mm -hmm. Very Beautiful. refreshing mm -hmm. that when you pick uh, oh. grapes for sparkling wines, ideally you're looking for high acids, um, right? And yeah. and well, especially when you pick at those lower sugars, right. their the acids are high, and it, so it's hard to sometimes tell how much residual sugar mm -hmm. is in these wines. But certainly they usually add that so-called dosage at mm -hmm. the end, which is a little mixture of wine to make up any volume difference, as well as the sugar that will determine the sweetness. Right. All of these wines are. Brute, yep. which, which is saying that less than 1.2% residual sugar or 12, 12 grams per liter, yep. uh, if you want to look at it in that measurement. And the, this wine, I don't know what the residual sugar is, I have to go look at the notes, but mm -hmm. I don't think we have them actually, but it uh, seems around maybe 1%. I think it's 1%. 10, 10, oh, okay. yep, 10 grams per liter of uh, for the dosage. I think a lot of people don't realize that the, the, the any sugar in sparkling wines at least when they're made this way, is coming from that dosage, right? Right. Yeah. So um, I think one of the things that California winemakers are particularly blessed with is the ability, you know, in some places where it's really cool, they they pick and they can make a first wine that's maybe eight, nine percent, and then they mm -hmm. have to chaptalize to right. get it up to the alcohol that they want, even before they add the yeast and um, the sugar to do the secondary fermentation. But here, we can kind of strike a nice balance. We get ripeness, but also by picking earlier, we retain the acidity and keep the alcohol lower, uh, 10%, like you said, mm -hmm. before the secondary fermentation. Yeah. So, yeah, anyway. The other nice thing about mum, um, and one of the reasons we're including them, is there was an article in the local paper mm -hmm. uh, during the fires that their winemaker, um, Ludovic Dervan, was creating these little um, boxes out of chicken wire mm -hmm. and two-by-fours, and they created these sifters that people who had lost their homes could go back yeah. and sift through the ashes to pick up any valuables. I saw that. Um, and that was a great article that inspired us to include his wine here as well. Yeah, so, absolutely. He's a great guy. Yeah, and it's, I mean, it's very refreshing, really, really, mm -hmm. I, I get that sort of apple quality you were saying, and a little bit of that creaminess. Right. Delicious. Okay. So move on to the main Caneros. Yes. A, a, sort of a, a staple in any uh, North California, Northern California household, right? Yes. Like drinking Domain Carneros is, um, and it's a beautiful estate. Mm -hmm. um, I've gone and sat out on the patio before and just enjoyed mm -hmm. the sort of majestic overlooking the vines and drinking well, lots of bubbles. Especially if you go late in the afternoon, watch the sunset go down. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yep. It's very busy usually though. It is busy. Yeah. yeah. Um, but so Domaine Carneros is, uh, of the wines that we have here, I believe it has the longest time on the leaves, right? We were talking about this before. Three years. Yep. Yes. And this is um, owned by Tattinger, which is a champagne house. And it seems that they really model their philosophy after longer time on the leaves, um, a nice emphasis on, it uh, seems like some reserve wines. And um, there, I think you get a lot of nuance and texture out of the Domaine Carneros. Yeah, and very much like the French Tattinger, I think Domaine Carneros follows the, the house style of being very elegant. Mm -hmm. um, they use a higher proportion here of Chardonnay, uh, which I believe is about 58, 60%, mm -hmm. and the rest is Pinot Noir. Mm -hmm. And that Chardonnay gives you that brightness, that elegance, that um, you know, good acidity. Mm -hmm. The Pinot Noir is going to give you a little body, maybe a little bit of a red fruit character, mm -hmm. but being more Chardonnay, this one definitely has that elegance and the finesse that um, is yeah. consistent with their French bottlings as well. Yeah, that would be a hard one because it's so close, like 60, 60 mm -hmm. 40, but I agree there's a pucker, that sort of lemon zest. There's something a little bit more lemony and fresh yeah. and elegant. Yeah, when I look at the, when I'm blind tasting, if I'm trying to decipher between Chardonnay and Pinot, Mm -hmm. For me, Chardonnay, a little more brightness, more acid, let's call it. Maybe a little more citrus, but also that mm -hmm. green apple, or more of a yellow yep. apple. Whereas yep. the Pinot Noir typically has a little more body and then will also have, definitely gets a red apple. Sometimes mm -hmm. you can almost get like a sour cherry note. Yep. And the color can be another clue. We didn't talk about the colors yet, but mm -hmm. um, kind of hard to see on this light. But I think there is a little bit of a deeper hue in the Domaine Caneros here, the yep. Pinot. Um, there can be yeah. other things affecting color as well, but sometimes you can see a little more golden color when it's mm -hmm. a red grape-based cuvee. Yep. 
I love that. I think it's, there's a, it, like you said, elegance, but then there is that sort of, there's a shoulder uh, of, of a little bit of, of, there's a little bit of power behind that too. There's a, there's a really beautiful streamlined elegance, but then that bit of Pinot, I think gives it a little uh, texture yeah. and sort of shoulder is what I'm calling it. Exactly. I don't know if that makes yeah, sense. Yeah, I know what you mean. <laughs> shoulder. So, shoulder, has shoulders. Um, so, uh, did we talk about the dosage on that? That is... Did not. Nine grams per liter. Nine grams, so pretty much the same. Pretty close. And again, you don't taste that sweetness. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. it, the acidity is so high that it finishes what I call dry. Right. Um, one of the things that's fun to do, especially if you're a student, you know, studying master sommelier or master wine, looking for wines, uh, kind of deciding what mm -hmm. it is and how much sugar is there. If you let the wines warm up and go, mm -hmm. let the bubbles subside, and then it almost tastes... You can really taste more of the sweetness, I think, at that point. Right. You can also sort of get a hint of the, the blend of the grapes when that temperature is a little bit warmer. Right. Well, and the bubbles mask that yeah. sweetness, too. Yeah, it's do. like, you yeah. know, if you're drinking a... That's what I mean. Let it go flat. Exactly. Okay. Yeah. And the other thing is, if you're looking for origin, I find that a lot of times after the wine um, has been in the glass, if it is a French champagne, for example, there is a certain minerality that comes through. Yeah. Like a wet stone or... Almost a flinty character. Chalky. And in California, you tend to get, you can have that minerality, but you almost get a riper fruit. Just a little bit more mm -hmm. richness uh, from the California climate. Yep. Well, and, and do you like to taste, uh, well, this is a, it's interesting because there was just an article about this, and it's an ongoing sort of debate of what sort of glassware to drink oh, your yeah. sparkling out of. But I personally, I blind taste out of white wine glasses, yeah. and I like to drink sparkling wine because... I view sparkling wine as a, a wine that sparkles, really, yes. like it's some of the best wines in the world are sparkling, but a lot of people just think they should only drink them on special occasions. Right. And, um, you know, uh, for me, there's a couple of reasons for drinking out of a white wine glass. One, I can smell a lot more. Yeah, wider and, surface area. Exactly. And, um, and two, I think it sort of gives a little bit more uh, credibility and um, it treats it more like a wine. Although I like, I like uh, coupes because they're yeah. kind of fun. They're kind of fun. And obviously you lose more bubbles in this in this situation, but I think you can taste more ultimately that way. Indeed. Yeah. Like you were saying, right. wait for it to go flat, and then you can see how good of a wine it actually is. Right. But I guess if you wait for it to go flat, then you've missed a lot of the fun. Yeah. You're not drinking fast enough <laughs> if you let it go flat. Only do that if you're taking an exam. <laughs> so we have two more wines to taste, and maybe mm -hmm. we should uh, demonstrate how to open Sure. Would you like to do one and I'll do uh, one? Or? Sure. <laughs> it's like, should we do them before at the same they get time? too warm under the lights? I right? know, they're getting right. So I love the producers that little, put a little colored gap yeah. on the foil so you know where to pull back mm -hmm. the foil. Yep. And Make it easy off. for us. Very easy. Well, easier. Maybe easier for you. Well, Strom's work has a very nice tab. Yep. They've made it very easy. So you have this little wire ring, and you know, at this point, I've always choose to put my thumb on top once I start to loosen it. And you turn it, I think it's mm -hmm. like, what is it, six and a half times, mm -hmm. I believe. And Good then loosen feel. the wire cage. And at this point, you never want to never. remove your hand. I've because done it. It's very dangerous. It can, the cork at this point is loose. It could come shooting out. Um, and I choose to put it between my thumb and my index uh, finger and then just turn the bottle. Mm -hmm. And if you do this, point it away from somebody. Yeah, um, I'm pointing it at Peter. This is yeah, really dangerous. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I was doing this once in a wine class and I had an ophthalmologist in sitting right in the front row. Oh, just in case. And he told me, he said, you know, you wouldn't believe the number of eye injuries I see between December 25th and January 1st. Oh, see, I ruined it. That was really too loud. <laughs> you That's know what they say, Mary Margaret? What? When you open the bottle, the sound should be no louder than a nun's fart. That's right. So, That's right. I'm sorry if I I heard a grandma's, anybody. I thought it was a grandma's whisper, Peter. Well, that it could be that too, yeah. <laughs> So I'm still working on this one. I'm see, yeah, see, we would be waiting for Let's Peter. See, here it comes. It's, we should have, I mean, this is truly like, uh, we should have a cloth over it. And, yeah. you know, we are not master sommeliers. This is perhaps one of the reasons why we, oh. That was pretty good, Peter. I don't know. Maybe grandfather's. I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> May I? Yes, please. We are masters of wine, but we can open uh, sparkling wine bottles. I just do it. Not as well as a master sommelier. No. Oh, my Lord, please. I'm sure that uh, one of them will watch at this point and laugh at the noise that my Schramsberg made. Exactly. And I hit the glass and all that. This is not good. But we are very good at drinking and tasting. We can do that. And exactly. this Rotor is, you know, one of those wines you said earlier that often is mistaken for a French yes. champagne. This is a wine, and we should mention all 
of the first three wines are all owned by French champagne houses, obviously. Yep. This is owned by Louis Roeder. The uh, wine that we're having is often has been put in master wine exams. Yep. And they'll put it next to their French counterpart. And you've got to figure it out. Yes, know? indeed. I remember actually studying and doing that, thinking, okay, this would be a really hard question if they were side by side. Can I do it? And, and truly putting them side by side, I think you really can tell the difference. It's very... Rotor has a bit riper fruit. It's just a little bit more forward. Yeah. You don't get the sort of chalky minerality. Exactly. And and when you do um, a domestic sparkling in traditional method side by side with a with a traditional method from Champagne or Francia Quarter or wherever it may be, I think you start to see those those differences. They become more obvious right. if you really really look for them. Um, but what I but but I mean I think Rotor is blocking malolactic fermentation. Pretty much, too. I think so. I think most people in California do yeah. um, to keep that keep it fresh. freshness. Mm -hmm. And this is uh, primarily Pinot, I think, about sixty forty. Mm -hmm. I mean, you have the numbers there. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. Oh no. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. Sixty forty Chardonnay and the minority here. Exactly. Over. But this is a wine that um, mm -hmm. I always find is a little bit richer, and again, that's Louis Roder style. Mm -hmm. One of the things they do is they do have some. This is a non vintage, so some of the reserved wines have been aged in oak, adding maybe a little more texture. Yep. Possibly a little hint of oak flavor, but I'm guessing they're older oak barrels. Yep. But this I has really got a, a and more than two years on the yeast, so this has got a lot of that toasty. Mm -hmm. I, think you, I think when you're blind tasting, you can justify reserve wines or, um, you know, higher quality blends because of that texture. Mm -hmm. To me, there's a, there's a very distinctive, beautiful texture to the Rotorer. And, um, I guess if I were, if I were trying to argue why that was, maybe it's because of the reserve wines and, um, just has a really nice balance. Yeah. I like that a lot. These are also different, but also good. Yeah. They're really, really yeah. amazing. Yeah. And you know we did want to include Mendocino mm. because there were some fires up in yep. Mendocino, mm -hmm. not in the Anderson Valley, but in Redwood Valley. And unfortunately, you know people aren't really talking about it very much, but no. uh, many, many people lost their homes. So yeah, I want to give a shout out to our northern neighbors. Absolutely, and and to point out that um it, you know just cooler climate, yeah. sort of the diversity of of climates within Northern California, and what great varieties and. Um, styles are made from cooler climate yeah. sites, right? right? And sparkling wines obviously need that cooler climate. Yeah. Um, and if you've never been to the Anderson Valley, it's a wonderful place to visit. I mean, there's so many, mm -hmm. mostly small wineries. Uh, Rotor is actually one of the bigger ones, mm -hmm. but there's just a uh, this pocket of wonderful locations for not only Pinot Noir, Chardonnay, mm -hmm. uh, you know, Riesling, Converge Terminer. Yep. There's some, uh, even at the higher elevations, you get a little Zinfandel, but it's great to, uh, drive through the beautiful Anderson Valley if you ever have the chance. It's beautiful. It really, really is. You and go I, out to the coast and, you know, go to Boonville mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. Mendocino. Drive up the coast and, and see where the ocean meets the meets the mountain. Yeah. I love that. Yeah. Um, yeah, Rotorer is kind of a go-to for me, too. I drink a lot of Rotorer. Yeah. Um, so, and I think it's showing really nicely right now, too. It sure is. Right out of the, right, just freshly popped. Yeah. A quieter pop than mine. So what do you think about this final one, mm. this so rosé? We had to include a pink. We did. Right? So I think a lot of people know and recognize Schramsberg. Um, it's on, you know, almost every wine list it, all throughout Napa. Right. Just because it's, it's nice to have something that's a, a local, really high quality example. And they make a range of wines, but the rosé I've always loved. I think it has this beautiful sort of salmon pink color that comes from that percentage of Pinot Noir. But in fact, this has, um, it's, it has a proportion of Chardonnay too. And I think actually it's the majority mm -hmm. is Chardonnay. So we just thought it would be interesting to point out that, you know, these, although uh, in some places people um, talk about high quality, you know, remember this debate about the best quality rosés aren't blends, right? Uh, you know, it has to be made from all red grapes. Well, in fact, some of the highest quality rosés from Champagne or other parts of the world are made by blending. Right. Um, that little hint of color comes from the Pinot Noir. Anyway, you, you get a really high quality, beautiful, sort of candied red mm -hmm. fruits, raspberry, and that little hint of autolysis. Almost like those sour cherry candy, those hard candies, you know, mm -hmm. that you get, I forget what they're called, but... Mm -hmm. And then this wine, does have a little barrel fermentation too. Mm -hmm. I think forty-three percent mm -hmm. is barrel fermented, mm -hmm. and when you taste it, yep. there's certainly more depth and breadth on the palate. 
yep. really has a richness and a fullness. It almost drinks like a like a lighter Pinot Noir. Like a light red wine. Mm -hmm. And the, the fruit source, 39% from Napa, 33% Sonoma, 16% Marin, and 12% Mendocino. Okay. So really a, a yeah. smattering of all these beautiful. Best of the best. Best of the best. Yeah. Um, very dry mm -hmm. uh, to me, really long finish, beautiful texture of bubbles. Um, and I just love drinking sparkling pink right. wines. I just love them. We, we need something to eat right now. I mean, this is like mm -hmm. my gastric juices are going. <laughs> <laughs> what do you drink yeah. with bubbles? Or what, do you, what do you drink with bubbles? What everything, do you eat with bubbles? Everything. everything yep. Yeah. Yep. Cheese. We should mention um, the reason like, people, when they have a glass of sparkling wine, why mm -hmm. they feel the effects pretty quickly. There's actually a physiological reason why the carbonation actually in, uh, makes the alcohol be absorbed much faster. Mm -hmm. In fact, there's a valve between your stomach and your small intestine called mm -hmm. the pylorus. Mm -hmm. And anytime you drink mm -hmm. anything that's carbonated, it actually relaxes that valve and opens it up so that anything that's in your stomach is moved quickly into your mm -hmm. small intestine. Now, alcohol is absorbed slowly through the stomach lining, but once it gets into your mm -hmm. small intestine, then it's like, you know, pedal to the metal. <laughs> so what happens is that if you drink something sparkling, it's carbonated, it quickly goes into your small intestine, and then you feel it more quickly. Yep. Um, that's the same reason why when people drink water, I always recommend you know, drink as much water as wine, but I always go for still wine yep. because the carbonated wine is just going to get you drunk faster. Right, exactly. Which can, you know, I love that sort of the feeling of the first glass of bubbles, yeah. but obviously, yes, drink with caution and know that it, it's going to speed things up a bit. Mm -hmm. um, I, I just feel like... Um, Sparkling wine is so much fun, and I really would like to see more people drinking it on a regular basis and not just waiting for their birthday or for Christmas right. or for New Year's. And um, even though these are all from the same state and very close by, by all intents and purposes, you have just such a diverse range of styles. And there are varying levels of, of dryness to a certain extent, although they're all dry. There are varying levels of autolytic qualities. To me, I actually got more, to me, I felt the autolysis the most on the Domaine Carneros. Mm -hmm. um, and there's varying levels of elegance and focus versus more breadth and richness, depending on the blend. Um, and there's just so much that you can do with sparkling wine. Yeah. I can. And the other thing is, you can spend about $7, maybe $10, buy a champagne stopper. Mm -hmm. That will keep that bottle of wine that you may not finish good for at least a couple of weeks. Yep. Um, the other night, believe it or not, we had a bottle of sparkling wine and I put the champagne stopper on, on it, but I didn't put it in the refrigerator. Mm -hmm. And the next day I was about to throw it out. My wife said, no, no. don't drink that. <laughs> so we put it back in the fridge and sure enough, it was great. It was fine. It was fine. Yeah. I mean, the, nothing, the best thing, but the carbonation is going to keep the wine fresh much longer than a still table wine. Yep. So it's yeah. a great thing to keep on hand. You don't have to finish a whole bottle. Is what you're saying. But I want to. Right? But you want to. We want to. We <laughs> yeah. want to drink these wines. We want you to enjoy these wines and yes. any more sparkling wines that you find out there. It's a, like Mary Margaret said, it's not a wine just for celebrations. It's a wine to be enjoyed any time of the year. Yes. And drink, um, drink obviously California, but if you want to do something that's educational, you can put it in the context of, you know, a champagne, a Francia Corda, a Cava, even throw a Prosecco in there and see if you can tell the differences and identify mm -hmm you know, where each wine came from and how they were made. Absolutely. Best way to learn is drink and study. Yeah. Ideally together, right? And drink some more. Yeah. <laughs> Cheers. Thanks. Cheers. <laughs>